The title came from the movie from the 1980s, The Gods Must Be Crazy, when these African Bushmen, uh, all they could discern about the life of the gods was from the only evidence available to them. And it was an empty Coke bottle that a helicopter pilot had just flung out the window as he uh, flew over. Um, our reader surveys for the last 15 years show that most alumni, 75% of them, get most of their news from the University of Chicago magazine. And as the editor of the magazine, I've always kind of thought that made me be a little bit like the guy in the helicopter who threw out the Coke bottle. Um, and you all have it drop into uh, your ground or your mailbox six times a year, and then that's what you've got. Now, with the advent of the, of the web, you have a lot more ways of quickly getting information about the university. But even so, um, if you're like me, I'm a very loyal alumna of my two institutions, but I don't get up in the morning the way I do and go and hit the New York Times or even once a week hit Peapod and go to my University of Edinburgh or Washington College to see what's happening. But when both of those uh, institutions send me anything in the mail, unless it looks too much like a fundraising thing. I, you know, pull it out and I open it. So I think we still are that same way, a little bit like the Bushmen, picking it up and wondering, OK, what can I find out uh, this time? Um, like the Coca-Cola company, over the 100 years of our history, we've changed our packaging and our content. And like the Coca-Cola company, sometimes more successfully than others, if any of you remember classic was it New Coke? And then we had to go back to Classic Coke. So we've had a few missteps, and I think you'll see some of them as I go through it. What I find, though, is when you look at 100 years of this, uh, you can see a lot about changes in magazine publishing, um, a lot about the spirit of the times in the, in the United States, and also a lot about the life stages of the university. Uh, sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's only with hindsight that we see this and wonder, huh. Um, I'm going to do it roughly at 10-year intervals. We're going to start with the first issue of the Chicago Alumni Magazine. This was March 1907. Uh, this is the cover, at least as it appears in the bound volumes that are in my office. For some reason, we don't have the cover, uh, so you'll have to imagine what it looks like. We do have the interior, uh, and this is volume one, number one. It begins, and is this dark? Can you all see it back there? Fine. Um, it begins with an article, uh, a letter from President uh, Judson, who uh, was the second president right after William Rainey Harper. Uh, it's the maiden publication, volume one, number one, and it includes a really long statement not only about the purpose of the Alumni Association, um, but also the purpose of the magazine. And that's just because I have this pointer. I'll use it. That's over there. And I'll quote a bit from it. The University of Chicago is not only an institution, it is a movement in itself. Its mission is the lifetime inspiration to effective service, stimulated by the innumerable associations inseparably connected with the city gray, that intangible everything we call the University of Chicago. The magazine will be the largest expression of, as the organ of this undying movement. Um, that tone was pretty solemn, and the look is pretty solemn and straightforward, too. Uh, it did begin with uh, alumni news, uh, news on the different clubs, and news on the classes. So from the very beginning, they had that. They didn't have pull-out quotes and photos, but they had the news. They also had advertising. Uh, and this lady uh, is saying, if I had only uh, the last 50 cents in the world, here's how I would spend it. I would put 25 cents on postum. Uh, I don't remember. Maybe they still make postum. 15 cents on grape nuts and 10 cents on cream, because I can, both of them would be pretty dry without it. Here's the August 1907 issue. Uh, Again, this is in a day when photography was expensive. They don't run very many photographs. For the first few years, it all tended to be either of important people or new buildings. 
another uh, building, this one of the law school, to illustrate a story on the history of the <coughs> JD degree. And then sports was uh, important then, so all the scores are there, and uh, two football players in the days, not only, I guess, without much padding at all, and there's an early Chicago C in all of its glory. Now, about 16 months into it, uh, the Chicago Alumni Magazine in October uh, 1908 merged with the quarterly alum university record, which was published by the administration, and it became the University of Chicago Magazine. And that's, that's essentially my first year. I kind of expanded it from 07 to the end. Now we're going to leap forward to November 1918. The cover looks very similar to the last one, a different building. But the winds of war have swept over campus in the past five years, and you see this on the interior. Uh, we have an ad from the press, uh, but the top uh, book is readings in the economics of war. Uh, World War I is definitely on everyone's minds. Um, the articles focus on war-related topics like the YMCA War Service and the founding of the Student Army Training Corps. And when you look at the images over here, you see that, which you can see without me, but I'll use it, you have both mortarboards and uh, uniforms together. The same thing happens um, in the Alumni News, which begins over on that side, uh, and then the Roll of Honor on the far right uh, is a listing of 27 alumni killed, wounded, or missing in action, as well as those dead from accident or disease. And when I did the count, it was more dead from accident or disease than war, which, uh, or action. Um, in the same way, the Alumni News had, as well as class listings, it started with alumni in service and alumni in service. And the old Hotel de Prada, which, which I thought it was elsewhere, but that's all right. Um, then when they do get to the news of the classes, they have a notice at the top saying that the magazine is cutting its pages by 10% as part of the war effort, and there, therefore there are fewer class notes, and there are fewer class notes that aren't war-related. There are also fewer advertisements, but the one for Swift's premium Olamargarine, uh, that butter substitute, boasts that it gives the most energy for the least money at a time when, quote, the conservation of food is of vital importance to the government. It's plain throughout this issue that the business of the university, like the country, is war. At the same time, it is November 1918, and uh, peace is about to descend, and we're about to move into the Roaring Twenties. And the two advertisements on the back page kind of bring it all, back of the book, bring it all together with two of the things that are most associated with the Roaring Twenties, music and motor cars. So we'll move into the next decade. Um, right a year before uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins became president and a year before the Great Depression, the November 1928 issue is uh, reflecting still the feeling of peace and prosperity, uh, the publication looks more like a modern newsstand magazine in the sense that it has cover lines advertising its content. We'll look at that. Uh, the University of Chicago Press has a history of William Rainey Harper for sale, and meanwhile, the Windermere Hotels are offering a special lunch before the big games, which are really big games. They're against Penn State and Illinois. Um, in the cover story, it's called Picking a President, Divinity School Dean Shaler Matthews explains why he is voting for Herbert Hoover but not before noting, as he might note about some more recent elections, that, quote, the real choice between the two candidates for the presidency of the United States lies not so much between the platforms as between personality. And they also had an, another story by somebody who was explaining why they were voting for Roosevelt, I guess. Um, the onward march of technology and printing has made it much less expensive to use 
photography. And for the first time in this decade, uh, photos appear in the magazine that aren't of newly dedicated uh, buildings or newly honored speakers or newly dead presidents, but rather illustrate professional research like this one from uh, newer studies of relaxation and sleep. And uh, this kind of is interesting, too, when you remember that I'm forgetting the guy's name. I think it's William Dement, but the person who discovered uh, REM sleep, REM sleep, uh, did it at the University of Chicago hospitals in the early 50s. So we were already doing sleep research. And the, the uh, little anagram of it over there, analog, sorry. All of the features in this issue, whether they were on sleep, presidential politics, anthropology, banking, or university history, were written by professors. Um, another sign that the focus had shifted, and this kind of does kind of indicate a, a shift, is that um, it's got, there's been so much institutional news, there are fewer class notes. Look, that's only, that's all the news about alumni of the college is contained on a half page. And this is at a time when the college uh, was huge. Um, now, we moved to the 30s. We got to skip the Depression uh, quite easily. Uh, they've got a new look. It's, it's been influenced by the kind of Art Deco st style. Uh, it's a new magazine size page, and we have a color cover. And that cover is paid for by the back cover ad. Uh, they had some beautiful ads for cigarettes in this publication through the uh, 30s. Um, can't run those anymore, but they're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, the magazine has developed not only a more urbane look, but an urbane tone that shows the influence of the New Yorker's talk of the town, and maybe the uh, Chicagoan, which there's a new book coming out from the press in September. Uh, it, the Chicagoan was a copycat of the New Yorker, and it didn't last as long, but it had the same covers. And uh, Neil Harris in the history department discovered the back issues a couple of years ago on the reg, and has written a book on it. Um, but that tone, uh, it kind of goes along with the tone that uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins had become known for, that ability to have the one-liner and, and wit. So, for example, um, here's the editor writing about the lead story, which is uh, Starred Men of Science. More important to scientists everywhere than who's who is to the nation is the bulky volume of American men of science who th whose eighth edition was issued recently. Academicians scurry to investigate the latest edition to see which scientists are distinguished in the listing by a star after their names. To be a starred man of science is roughly equivalent to all America rating in football and not nearly as transitory. I think that last line comes from all too bitter experience. The UFC at that point hasn't had a championship football season since 1924. This is 1938, and we're only one year away from President Hutchins deciding to get out of the Big Ten and football. But it is kind of interesting that the two are juxtaposed, the champions of 91 back in the day, and a story about our new starred men. And it's also interesting. Uh, that there are 12 starred men of science, which outdoes the football 11 by one. No longer to be, to be known for our men of brawn, the university will now have to be known for its men of brains. The layout reinforced that concept. At the same time, in the 1938 magazine, more articles were uh, written by alumni, and I wanted to point out that our athletics column in that issue may be the only one in any American alumni magazine at any point that was written by a Heisman Trophy winner. He was, uh, Jay Burwanger was our sports columnist for a couple of years, which I think is a star distinction. Uh, and advertisements were back again in categories from electrolysis, destroys 200 to 600 hair roots per hour, I love that one over there, through fences, flowers, and fracture apparatus to mattresses and painters. Everything could be gotten here. And then uh, the next slide is also uh, 
the next month. It's, it is that end of an era. Uh, the grand old man, Amos Alonso Stagg, is retiring from the university, and with him gone, Hutchins could finally make his move. <coughs> Ten years later, 1948, we've had the luck of skipping both the Depression and World War II in this 10-year slice that I've done. Um, the magazine's cover still features a campus scene, but the back cover ad is this is an advertisement for Union Carbide, which shows that we're, like the rest of the country, moving toward what Eisenhower will soon dub the military-industrial complex. And indeed, through the 50s, most of our back cover ads are from uh, big industry. This is one of my favorite stories. It's uh, the lead story about the recently completed admin building. Uh, the university moves in. It begins back in those pre-feminist days as followed. Early in August, the trim little girls of the controller's office, uh, they're talking about the secretaries and administrative assistants. Uh, in this story, the, they, the party line is followed. There's praise given for how uh, efficient this building is going to be. But pretty soon thereafter, in other issues, the magazine reports that many people on and off campus consider the admin building out and out ugly. Um, the general mood is businesslike. There's post-war seriousness, uh, faculty written articles on topics like communism in Europe and America, a comparative view. Uh, at the same time, the eternal verities or semi-eternal verities are here, class notes and advertisements. And again, there's Bell Telephone. It's, it's no longer Swift's premium ham and bacon or something like that. It's, it's big business. And on the back cover, um, we go. This back cover is a, a decade later, uh, 1958, uh, another military industrial complex ad. But the front cover has changed. It breaks with tradition and doesn't feature a campus scene. Instead, it announces an article, The College, New Faculty. Uh, true, the image of the students uh, doesn't go with the words. We can't see the new faculty, only the students. But the image does herald a greater emphasis on what's going on inside the buildings rather than the outsides of them. Does anybody notice anything else different about this cover? And I will ask you again. In a minute. Okay, we'll see another one of these. Uh, so here's the article. Um, there are very few women in this picture, which is uh, not to be unexpected um, because w there were fewer women on the campus. And perhaps one reason for that is that in the 1950s, it was really the absolute bottom, as a lot of you know, in terms of the numbers of undergraduates enrolled at Chicago and uh, the feeling that the south side of Chicago was not really the place you wanted to be. Um, I mean, maybe you didn't want to send your daughters there, at least. Um, this whole article is on how uh, the changes in the college are going to bring back vibrancy, relevancy, and therefore more students. At the same time, here's another cover from that same year. Uh, anybody want to take another look at the cover? I think this is really... Uh, can you all see that with the light from... You all have better... I'm going to take it down just for this one because it's a little... Uh, did that make it better? Much better. I know he hates it. But for, <laughs> but, but for this one, you know, this kind of collage thing, it, it, it's one of the rules that Dan will tell you. And our art director says, you know, if one picture is worth 1,000 words, two pictures are worth 500. It, it just, the more you add, unless it's a really strong collage, you get, you get into trouble, and this did it. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is that not only did the logo uh, change, but what word is the biggest? 
And this, you know, I, I first gave a version of this talk when President Sonnenschein was here and, and the word went out that this is Chicago, not the University of Chicago, uh, as part of the effort to make the university get the reputation that uh, it deserves. And I think this is when President Kimpton was here. Kimpton was an earlier form, in my opinion, of President Sonnenschein. He wanted Chicago to come back. Uh, that's why the emphasis on improving the college. And also, if we look at it in the light of, or the lens of today's interest in working with the community again in a slightly different way, this is the place where the university had decided we're not going to Stanford, we're not moving to California, we're, we're in this uh, city and we've got to work with it. And so this story, uh, go back to that, is uh, a trio of cover stories uh, on the effort to rebuild the neighborhood surrounding the university, uh, which kind of began in the early 50s, and now they have some stuff to report. A community of scholars. They show the uh, meeting uh, in February 1952 when 2,000 Hyde Parkers packed Mando Hall and the Reynolds Club, kind of standing room outside the hall in a community meeting where the uh, Southeast uh, Commission I know I don't have the exact name right, was formed. Um, old buildings were uh, torn down, slums were things that had allowed, been allowed to become them, and uh, new plans were made. 48 acres of slum and blight centering around 55th and Lake Park have been cleared at a cost of approximately $11.5 million, and we're going to have apartments, homes, and a shopping center. Some people would say that, that the apartments are kind of a different form of blight, particularly the ones in the middle of 55th, but that's all right. And uh, plans for how the future would be. Hyde Park uh, student apartments for married students. But along with the big plans for the institution, it is still a hybrid of the administrative institutional magazine and the alumni <coughs> magazine. And so there is stuff about people. Um, on page 28 of the October 1958 issue, Reunion cover had a, uh, Coverage had a series of photographs of Mrs. Una Nelson from the class of Ott 8. Um, and she was learning to frizz. They spelled that F-R-I-Z. Uh, it was an, a frisbee. Uh, the magazine notes that catching the bright colored plastic platters, which float eerily and unpredictably, has become a major campus activity. So they let the old folks try it out at reunion. There's also a note in this issue announcing the retirement after 26 years and 11,000 dissertations of the university's fiercely correct and somewhat fondly remembered dissertation secretary, Kate Turabian. Without Kate to guard the gate, could the barbarians be far away? Well, they, they, the barbarians were approaching, but they weren't quite there. This is the July-August 1968 issue. On the surface, things look calm enough. Uh, the lead story is on a very 60s topic, the generation gap. And if the magazine is doing its best to straddle that gap, it appears to be leaning a little bit more to the conservative older side in its look. Um, I like this because it shows that there are more eternal verities. This is reunion coverage. There's the tour of the neighborhood and uh, then, you know, just the, the fun time looking through the uh, old yearbooks and so on. And another eternal verity uh, begins here, building the Regenstein, we always need more room for books. But that fall came a new look for the magazine. I'm very fond of this look. Uh, this is um, the fall issue with the cover on Edward Levy's inauguration. Perhaps the only, and I know it's true in my tenure, the only time a president has been inaugurated at Chicago where he wasn't or she wasn't put on the cover of the magazine in, with the photograph. Instead, it's about the ceremony itself done in, and, and the story kind of begins like that way. Um, the same way, it's, it's become a, a more of a New Yorker-y uh, kind of words and an evocative picture rather than lots of little photographs. 
And um, the style is really clean and classic. It's almost too clean, and particularly for archivists and historians. The folios on these, the page numbers, don't give the month and year of the issue, uh, which drives me crazy. I mean, I was looking here so I could tell you what month this actually was, and I'm going, well, I, I have to go back and look and figure it out. Um, and then these covers. Um, I went, I graduated from college in 1973, and we had a yearbook done with, uh, not here, beautiful photographs, but why put people's names and, and degrees and so on? Because the essence of the person, that, that's stupid information, right? So photographs of everybody in my class, they're just there, no name. And now I go back and I go, was that Fred? Was, did he, is that Betty? And I just wish they had put our, our names. And I have no idea, you know, uh, it would be nice to have had some cover lines, but the idea was the image alone was enough. And you'll see that we have, you know, changed the, uh, the cover. Even the name of the institution has been pushed back from its uh, Kimpton prominence. Uh, the co this covers a story about cancer research. They did give us a little hint there. Uh, and this cover also uh, shows another really big thing of the 60s, posterizing everything. It, it reached its zenith in this issue. Uh, from the fall of 1969, uh, there are no cover lines. There's no, they don't put a date on the front cover either in these issues, you note. But let me tell you, when you look inside this one, um, I'll tell you, you're reading the September slash October slash November slash December issue. Numbers one and two of the volume year. You know, loosen up, man. Deadlines? Who, you know, why make them? Um, now, I have to point out that I am, all, I am a child of the 60s, um, adolescent of the 60s, and uh, I am kind of the July-August issue is two weeks late as I stand here, so I can't really say too much about uh, people's deadlines. Um, the definitive art form of the decade is the protest t-shirt and the protest poster, and the alumni magazine handles a lot of its art by posterizing it. Um, I am going to read you the, uh, this spread, which I want to go down on this one too. This is a story on the return of Maroons football after, uh, I have to do the math, but what, 30 years absence. I'm going to read you the story in its entirety. And I, there are, it is an eight page story, so please bear with me. Mm -hmm. David Windsor's photographs capture the Chicago Maroons return to the gridiron for the first time in 30 years. Ending their first season on the short side of two victories to four losses, Coach Haas feels, I hope I pronounced that right, feels this augurs well, but says, we will not accept a bowl bid this season. Chicago won't be charged with overemphasis. That's the story. I've read it all for you. And as an editor who's two weeks behind on deadlines, I wish I could get away with this today. And, and frankly, I, I love this. I, 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 but then again, that's... It was an era and a time, and now we're going to move forward to 1978, and uh, morning is back in America, so the lights will go up. Uh, by autumn 1978, not only football, but also normalcy has returned to campus. Uh, what could be safer than a self-contained uh, nicely self-contained little small image that we can get ourselves around of ivy and statues. We're, we're back to normal folks here. Um, the main story is uh, reporting on the inauguration of, of Hannah Holborn Gray. So here was another one where the president wasn't on the cover, I stand correctly. Uh, the magazine's story is very straightforward. There are neat boxes keeping everything in place and there's even the American flag prominently displayed. And again, keep those boxes there. Uh, the, another feature takes as its theme, the class of 1982 were pretty normal. Uh, though there's a faint touch of Chicago-style irony to the statement and the illustration that goes with it. 
not quite normal. Uh, but at the same time, the college uh, students profiled come from places like Evanston and Downers Grove. Their hair is long, but not too long. And they're upbeat and optimistic. It really is almost morning in America. Uh, there's also a look back at the revolution's survivors. This is a, a story on the class of 68, uh, their, their 10 year reunion. Uh, they reflect on the college, uh, the light sides of their years of protest, and then a look over here, doubt and divorce, about the issues that they're facing now. If Mrs. Gray didn't make it on the cover for her inauguration, she did for the 10-year anniversary. Uh, she's been in office for 10 years in, in fall of 1988. <laughs> Uh, the magazine has made the word Chicago bigger again. We go back and forth, back and forth. And uh, you'll note that Mrs. Gray is neatly contained still in a box. Um, and so the rest of the stories, box, boxes were really big uh, in the 80s. Um, although the issue has several articles commemorating her presidency and its accomplishments to date, there's a balance between institutional alumni news. Uh, this is the highlights of the Gray presidency, and I enjoy the fact that among the highlights up here is uh, a picture of Sleep Out, uh, which uh, has since, of course, become a victim of online course registration, so this, it's a nice thing to note. Um, indeed, the overall emphasis in 1988 was on people, uh, lots of people, uh, lots of very small photographs of people, whether at reunion or in the family album uh, photographs of graduates and their U of C relatives. We had to stop this practice uh, with the centennial because we did the count and realized that one issue a year of the magazine uh, at the rate we were going as the more and more people were becoming uh, family album material would be devoted to them. Uh, then there was also a department called, in a phrase that makes me cringe, you see people. Um, I prefer U of C people. And this was on interesting students and alumni. Um, now we're going forward to October 1998. Um, Chicago's still big. In fact, it's even bigger as part of the logo. Uh, the Phoenix is rising. It's made it back to the, the cover. And we have a Dan Dry photo essay as our cover feature. Um, and even though I said that about one picture worth a thousand words, two worth 500 and so on, uh, this is a collage that the art director put together. And the reason for that was this particular one was called uh, Piecework. And uh, we'll see it a little bit later. It's, it's about details. Um, when we redesigned, uh, the, the letters section was, it was redesigned to allow the magazine to quote uh, Chicago's very quotable alumni. Uh, there's, it's always fun to pick out what pull-out quote we're going to use for each letter section. This one, what I loved, he let his Hawaiian shirts do the talking. Uh, would gone to full color throughout, whether in this section on faculty research or institutional news, which in this particular issue happened to feature two prominent alumni, Jerry Ratner with his gift to the Ratner Athletic Center, and Janet Rowley, who had uh, won an award, and actually Dan Koshlin had, but we only had Janet on the cover. And then back to another eternal verity, an interview with the then director of the Regenstein Library, No Room at the Reg, What Would We Do? And here's the uh, photo essay, Piecework. Uh, this was about the beauty of the quads being in the details. And, and Dan took these. Bring it down. And Dan, later, will tell us, or you can tell us now. I forget how you. It was a, I shot everything on slide. It was back when we were still using film and slides. And then I transferred the majority of the pictures that I felt should be used larger to Polaroids, and we published the actual Polaroids. And, um, and then the art director, Alan Carroll, uh, who Mary Ruth has a long relationship with, uh, we worked together to use some straight photos and then uh, mainly uh, the, the Polaroid transfer shots. So it was, it was a it's really fun piece to do. 
And this is a, the second spread of that. And I actually have one in my, I hope I still have it in my office unless I took it home. <laughs> I think, okay. Sometimes I move it back and forth. There we go. Uh, then we started the college report back then, and this was, again, it's a continuing theme back to President Kempton. Uh, this was the result of uh, the changes that were made to the size of the college and the emphasis on the extracurriculars as part of uh, President Sonnenschein's time. That we, uh, one unusual thing about the University of Chicago Magazine is it's the umbrella publication of the university. It goes to 144,000 readers, uh, the graduates of all the divisions. But every other division and every other school has its own publication. The college did not. So uh, for a while, about three or four years, we had uh, a special insert. At first it went only into magazines that went to college alumni, and then it was decided uh, that all alumni should be aware that if they had been here at graduate school, they might have thought of the college as one thing, and when their kids were deciding where to go to school, they'd say no, and that they should know that changes were uh, being made. So for a, a while, uh, we, we ran this in everybody's magazine. Uh, and here was one of the stories. It was a, an interview with Michael Benke, uh, who was brought in to uh, increase the enrollment and, the, and while not losing the quality of the students who enrolled. Uh, the class notes, uh, this was also the era when we introduced class correspondence. And, uh, which I'm happy about because it gives it a much livelier feel and a more personal feel than it, it did when we were just writing them. Although I think we got more gifts to the magazine when we would send out one solicitation a year and we would say, give some money and include your notes for the magazine. You know, they would, although we got a lot of envelopes back with no money in class notes, um, but they were all written as, you know, much more simply the accomplishment, not the sense of tone, and we never had nice reunion reports. And then we did class high notes. This was, this, this was simply <coughs> news taken out of the uh, class notes so people would get a range of stuff that's going uh, on among the classes because you probably aren't reading all of the class notes. And then, uh, I just brought, put this up. We always do something, magazine studies show that one third of readers enter a magazine from the back of the book. So while you're focusing on the front door, you have to realize that you know, people go around to the back. So you always want to have a self-contained back page. A lot of alumni magazines, I sometimes teach a course for alumni magazine editors, and they are the continuation of the obits on the back page, which is really kind of a, you know, in, it's not in the middle of life, it's in the middle of death as you come in. So for a few years, we had a uh, Chicago file, uh, an alumna who is a cartoonist, Jessica Abel, AB91. Now, I am taking a few pages from more recent issues. This was last summer. Uh, you'll note Chicago has gotten even bigger in every, if it, if the university has, and it certainly has on our cover. Um, we got rid of the phoenix. The phoenix comes and goes. I'm sure he will be back again. But we did keep uh, the uh, pull-out quote from the letters because alumni writers are still quotable. This one was a little snide. Only a social scientist could seriously argue that. But we like them to be a little bit uh, provocative. And over on the side, uh, we have an advertisement for something that we get from the Ivy League magazine network, which helps us. Uh, we still do alumni profiles. Uh, we still do institutional news. And of course, faculty research. And we have started an arts and letters uh, column. Because we're 100 years old, we're going to redesign the magazine in the coming year. And we're not happy totally with the arts and letters because we realized we, we were doing this because we felt we didn't cover all of the arts enough. We used to do a book section and people would say, well, I do stuff in the arts, but I'm not writing books. So we started this. But it's beginning to dawn on me that all the people who do stuff in science and the social sciences need to have their own 
uh, place. So we're, we're going to rework how we uh, pull out uh, alumni of note. Um, from our pages is going to be gone for a while. We've been doing this for a long time and we figure we're 100, we're giving up. Um, and again, because our alumni are so quotable, we, we have been using pull-out quotes from the class notes to kind of give a sense of uh, what people are thinking and saying. And then for the past couple of years, after Jessica Abel retired uh, to focus on books, she has two coming out this spring and babies. She had a daughter who's about six months old uh, and looks gorgeous, reading the New York Times style section in the photograph I got last week. Um, we decided to do something called Light of the Mind. Uh, and we're, we're running out of Light of the Mind ideas. We've already carved a gargoyle into a watermelon. We uh, gave knitting instructions for a University of Chicago scarf. We had uh, an, a, a person fold the Assyrian bull at the OI um, out of origami, you do an origami fold. And then we did a tattoo last year. So that'll be something we have to rethink. What are we going to do when light of the mind is gone? Um, and then um, as we uh, reconsider the magazine, I just want to remind you that we do, we have been online. We've been online since December 1994. It is searchable. Uh, we're starting in the next couple of weeks, and we'll continue over the year ahead to revamp our, our site and expand it. Uh, we have Yushablago, which is uh, news three times a week. And another thing we have is uh, books. We got rid of our uh, listing of every book that alumni uh, published because it was getting to be too much. And oh, am I going to have to do that? Let's see if that works. All right, let's go. And so now we weekly, you submit your book information and weekly it's updated. And I was very happy last night when I went to see if I could hit this link to see that it was updated yesterday on time. Uh, so you can, you can submit anything you want to say about your book, a link to the publisher's page and, and so on. And, and it makes it uh, better for them. So that actually is uh, it for me. And we'd love, Dan and I, to uh, hear whatever you'd like to ask about. Yes? I'm kind of curious, since you've started doing the online version, are you getting traffic on a different type of article than the... the than you know, it's really interesting. I, I looked the other day uh, to see what had been the most popular article, and it was Neil Shubin's uh, piece from early in the year on a Fish Out of Water was what we called it. It was an excerpt from his uh, book, and I'm going to forget that title. But then I, I went down our Google Analytics to see what the referring site was, and it was um, New Scientist had done a link to it, the British Science Magazine, and that has kept it alive. We did an article on Kevin Murphy. Dan shot the cover, uh, well, he shot the whole story for it. It was a great photo of Kevin in one of his many baseball caps, The Economist. Well, Kevin is a friend of Steve Levitt, and when in, he took his Freakonomics blog and just had one of those little sentences like, the University of Chicago Magazine has a great uh, profile on my colleague, Kevin Murphy. And that thing went out the roof. Uh, less happily, we had a, uh, oh, how can I put this? A very right-wing talk show host uh, saw an article uh, about some, a topic that he thought was uh, crazy and, and linked to it for a while uh, about some research. And, and all of a sudden, I noticed that that article had gone way up. I looked at the who had what the referring was, saw that this guy was really awful, and so then kind of alerted the news office so that the news officer in charge of that particular researcher could let the person know that they had, this had been picked up and they, they figured out what they were going to do about it. And luckily, the guy wasn't that popular, but it was interesting to just have seen that little spurt. So you really have no control over uh, what gets picked up. That origami piece was hot for a long time because pe there, there are a lot of origami uh, people out there, and they found it fascinating. I mean, um, the, the OIs 
we gave it to them after Dan had taken the photograph of it, which was a great photo because we used one of my black velvet blouses because we couldn't find our black velvet, and Dan had a, ca a ladder up so that you had the real Assyrian bull, you know, in the background of the of the origami piece, and the the OI now has has the paper one, but because it was so complex and the guy who did it is quite famous in the origami world, it got linked to a lot. And also that scarf got linked to in loads of places because evidently people like to knit and it was the first scarf with the University of Chicago C in it. It is amazing, as Mary Ruth says, what happens and I notice it in my own website. I mean, you know, you'll get these spikes and you'll think, you know, wow, how did you know, happen here or what, you know, what? I shoot the every uh, year. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, get to your uh, website. <laughs> Churchill Downs, and so the Monday after the Kentucky Derby, I get a huge spike. <laughs> every year goes to, uh, and you need to put in the www. Do I really? Yeah. Aren't I, even though I'm there? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Um, with the uh, program that we have going on with it. But, um, yeah, you know that guy. Good. Um, but you know, it is it, it is interesting about how you know what people find fascinating, what they Google, and and that's you know, I mean, it really does affect your traffic. One of my best buddies helped Mary helps Mary Ruth with the um, doing the online stuff, and, and he said, you know, he'll hear numbers and he's amazed just you know it's all of a sudden my god you know what, what? happened here to get this huge spike yeah there are some nice chicago ones in there well it's it's interesting too because every uh, um, as part of the ivy league magazine network we've been having discussions about advertisers want to have um in this magazine advertising is not doing that great and magazine uh, advertisers want to have web extras and, they, and we want to know how many hits magazines are getting but it's very hard to decide what the best methodology for the number of hits is um, but at the same time when you see that spike whenever we send out uchicago.edu the number of hits to the magazine it, it goes up like that on that day and then comes down for you know for two days after that which goes back to what I said earlier which is people are interested in their uh, university but they aren't going to go to it every day uh, though when it comes to their mailbox uh, they're more likely to be reminded of it so ooh. other questions or are we just going to look at Dan's food? <laughs> well, I, I will tell you, I will tell you, Dan and I went to, um, to do the story on uh, Barcelona and the Paris Center, the two programs the college had. And my favorite part of it was every night we'd go to dinner and Dan would take a photograph of my dessert on my cell phone. And it, if, if I, I, might, I, I might possibly actually have that. Maybe it's under family. Let's see. Mm. There is family. Let's see if my it's there. Oh. It was it was a lovely thing called Mom's cell phone goes to Europe. <laughs> but but he gave good hints and you should give the hints that you had. Oh, that's not the one I want. All right. So, these aren't Dan Drive. Yeah, my cell phone goes to Europe twice. And I think you can guess the ones that are the Dan Dry photos as compared to the ones that are, are mine. But does that not look like a nice... Uh, it's actually kind of fun sharing with the phone. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> and it's really interesting because when I was, I was many, I worked with Nikon camera company for many years. I remember when they first talked to me too many years ago about testing digital, you know, the camera was the size of a bread box and would weigh the, t the amount of a brick, you know, of a cinder block. And it was not quite hmm? the uh, quality of a crummy cell phone these days, but, you know, almost that good. And I'm thinking, you know, this I guess we're good. But it was... 
and, and this, I think, um, you know, what, just what Mary Ruth was doing with her daughter, I think it, it, it really does, it's kind of a comment on, on adapting to this technology, adapting to the blogs, and adapting to the internet, because, you know, it, it is something that is definitely not the future, but here, and I think the, the, the magazine has been very aggressive in uh, the, the feature the use of Lago that Mary Ruth mentioned, and and it's um, it's fun because a lot of uh, different people who are associated with the magazine, uh, it's really a great exposure for our interns, and because they can go out and take their own photographs and they can. Well, they can write, and, and they can write and get something edited and right. published, yeah, you know, in, in a right. couple of days. I would like to point out about this one, because he did give great tips, like if you don't have a filter, you can take the blue lid of a plast of a uh, water bottle, and you can get your blue filter that way. And the, this was at a nice enough restaurant, but the placemats were paper, and they showed every different type of tapas that you could have, you know, and they showed little pictures. And when it came time to do dessert, the man said, turn it over, and we'll now have a white backdrop for stuff. So it did remind you that you can change your environment as a, a photographer, uh, which I never tend to do, although I will say, and then we'll stop this. But I had to take this photograph of cereal with Johnny Depp on the cover. <laughs> and so, yeah, travel is so broadening, isn't it? Other questions? If, if, is there anything that you would like the magazine to do that it's not doing, or any complaint you would like to make, or as we expand uh, our presence on the web, things that you would like us to to do? We really are in this stage where we're exploring, and and and, it, and the only reason we're doing it, frankly, is for alumni. We're not. Uh, uh, it's great because you don't have to worry about selling it. Now, I work. 10 years with National Geographic, and you know, I mean, you're, you know, where are my subscriptions? What am I getting this? Am I getting that? And you know, with this, as she says, you just want to. Well, but at the same time. All the time, which at, at the University of Chicago, we know that can be a well, you, you want people to open the magazine. That, that is a, a, a goal. So if, if there's something that you would open the magazine for that we're not doing, um, Yes. This isn't something that you're not doing that I'm suggesting, but what you talked about using the camera, using the cell phone thing, I wonder if there isn't another new direction like in the letters to say, and those of you who feel like it, why don't you take a picture with your camera? <laughs> well, I think I, I, and I have to tell you, we're, we're thinking, one, we've come up with a, kind of a three stage plan for uh, things to add to the web and we're thinking of like photo of the day but everybody would be allowed to not allowed to encourage the, the uh, but but than in the it, actual magazine even though the quality if it's a small enough picture wouldn't be that mm -hmm. you know I mean even saying here's something we got from the alumni meeting in mm -hmm. Cleveland mm -hmm. Ohio I mean, it'd be fun. And the other side, you could maybe even do a contest, um, you know, at the end of the year. I mean, it'd be an interesting thing to see what people. Well, and it's true. And if you, I think, if you did a contest more to get the best photo, because I have to say, as an editor, sometimes you go, okay, another person in front of a, a podium, um, in the night. Yeah. So. Uh, thank you for coming. And one last piece of shameless self-promotion. We have pr produced a book, coffee table book, that's being sold upstairs and has been offered from the <coughs> magazine. Uh, Mary Ruth uh, did all the writing. I did all the photography. Uh, the designer did all that we use for the magazine did all the design. Uh, one of our uh, staff guys did uh, all of the color management, the magazine staff was very involved. And I worked on it for a year on photographing. It's a pretty fun chronicle of the university, so that's my last piece of magazine, shameless self-promotion. <laughs>
We, we decided, I've seen some magazines uh, celebrate their 100th anniversary by doing a special issue about the history of the magazine. And frankly, I think a, an institution uh, or a magazine like uh, The Atlantic maybe deserves a special issue like that. But we wanted to uh, celebrate by uh, doing something special of what we've done for the last 100 years, which is show the campus scene. So that it was our, our birthday present, actually to the campus and, and then also in a way to ourselves. So um, we had fun doing it. And if you want one, get one. We, we've, we've had an ad and we've, there's a, there ought to be coming soon to a mailbox near a lot of you will be an, another solicitation. And uh, if they're like Dan's first book, which was done uh, for the centennial of the university, someday you'll find them on eBay um, when, they, when you can't find them anywhere else. Right. And they are snatched up for a, a high price. And we, we do say that we, we have a, the photographs, of course, are the same quality in both, but we have a better design and we actually have captions in ours. So <laughs> it will be very helpful to you if your memory goes, as long as you can still read if you buy ours as opposed to the other one, OK? Thank you again for uh, coming and letting me have the chance to go back and look at the 100 years. Thank you.